very good morning to all honorable participants to the guest speaker i welcome on behalf of our academy and all the participants today's guest speaker professor dr g mohan gopal sir former director national judicial academy bhopal i also welcome all the honorable justices from sri lanka nepal india all honorable directors of state judicial academies and their co directors all honorable registrar generals of the high courts registrars and their team members all honorable principal district judges principal judges district judges all my brother and sister judicial officers public prosecutors members of general justice boards and principal magistrates and students and all other invitees i also welcome my co-host sri chetan singh shergil who is uh, conducting this program from on behalf of the scc online i also welcome sri karan malik and sanjay kapoor and their team who are collaborating with us from scc online it's a pleasure to arrange this webinar with such a eminent speaker honorable dr mohan gopal sir is well acquainted well known to all of us in, not only in india internationally he is former director of the national judicial academy bhopal sir's main main area of work is the institutional framework of law and justice with the kind permission of honorable sir to save the time i would skip some portion of introduction to keep it as possible as as far as possible so with this introduction i would now request the guest speaker to take over the session and start his session and uh, you may post your queries in the charts uh, which will be put up to the speaker uh, for your kind information i have to inform that the session is being recorded so that it can be viewed by those persons who could not access it with uh, with the assumed kind permission we are recording it thank you very much uh, i would like to begin by saying two things one is to say that um, my work is on how we apply theory to improve practice i don't work either just on practice and i don't work just on theory either um and a good example i use is to uh, is to uh, refer to the work done to produce the vaccine for covid the covid vaccine is not produced by doctors and nurses who are on the front line working with uh, Uh, uh patients treating them um uh, and giving them relief but they are actually produced by uh, researchers they are not researchers who are just doing abstract theory but researchers who are actually producing solutions um, for the virus for the covid virus and so the the uh, vaccine is produced by researchers why because the researcher studies the virus but the researcher also has a responsibility to come up with vaccines that can actually be used and applied and can give relief the doctor and the judge uh, like the judge focuses on relief to the individual patient or the individual litigant whereas the uh, researcher studies the virus and understands the virus across different patients and 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 figures out ways in which we can neutralize the virus so researchers like me we work on the virus of injustice not only in india but across the world how do we understand this virus of injustice in fact john stuart mill and later amartya sen have tried to uh, to define justice by identifying what is injustice as something that we have to definitely uh, fight and neutralize like we have to fight a virus so we we want to to understand and study the nature of injustice that we see and come up with solutions that can be applied in, in on a day to day basis by judges and courts in order to um, 
reduce injustice and promote justice. Now, um, from the Indian constitution's point of view, we have a, a, a very clear mandate for the Indian legal system set out in Article 39A of the constitution, which says that the state shall secure that the operation of the legal system promotes justice on the basis of equal opportunity. So the two word mandate of the constitution of India for the Indian legal system, which I think is a, is a universal idea, is that it should be um, it, that, that it should be uh, promoting justice. And um, uh, I think that's 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 not exceptional. Maybe it's a little exceptional to have it uh, in the constitution itself. And therefore, we have to uh, uh, we know that the role of the court is is to is uh, uh, it requires us to understand very fundamentally uh, what is justice and how to promote it. And uh, so that is an example of a fundamental concept, which if we apply, the question is, will, will, the, uh, will, the, will greater clarity in understanding the fundamental concept of justice, which is dear to the hearts of all lawyers and all judges and all people, uh, will it help improve the operational efficacy of courts. That's a question. I believe it will, and, but it requires some reflection and, and deep thought. And, um, and I think that's what we are going to do. The second question leading on from this uh, is for many, many years now, from, I've been working on Judicial Academy for 15 or 16 years now, since 2004, actually coming up to 17 years. The years are just flying by. Uh, and uh, as director since 2006. Um, but uh, what I found what uh, when I went to the academy uh, was that a question that is on the minds of almost all people in the country, uh, in all countries everywhere, is was not very much uh, seriously considered in the academy. And that question was, why is it that different people uh, get different, let's say in criminal law, different people get different kinds of punishment. Somebody gets five years, somebody gets six years. Why, why, is, why, and why is it that some decisions, a very common question asked of me by non-lawyers is, why is it that a court gets reversed by a higher court? So who is right? There are two views here. Who is right? Can you simply say hierarchically that the higher court is right? In which case, why did in the Indian Supreme Court reverse itself in, uh, or in, in the, for example, in the famous emergency era case of ADM Jabalpur. So people are not clear why. So I, I asked some of the most senior and distinguished judges uh, who I first met in the National Judicial Academy, judges of the Supreme Court, after I became the, the, the director of the National Judicial Academy, the same question. So they told me, Professor, it is because the facts vary from case to case. And therefore, when the law is applied to facts, obviously you don't get um, uh, the same result. As far as appellate courts are concerned, they appreciate law and facts in a different way than uh, the, uh, the, and correct errors in appreciation of facts and law. So I told them, I said, why don't we, why don't we try this in a, in a, in a simulation? And uh, they agreed. And in their presence, we carried out a number of simulations where we had the same facts and the same law argued by the same people in front of a large number of judges in a simulation. And we, we found that we were getting sometimes 60% guilt, 40% acquittal. Sometimes we were getting different ratios, but sometimes we were, we were getting close to complete agreement that when the same facts and the same law were heard, all judges reacted the same way. Sometimes when the same law and the same facts were heard, judges reacted in a very different way. So we then clearly through this evidence, we established that uh, we need to understand this. We, we, we established that in some occasions, in some cases, whether or not you have liability in a particular case has a, has, you know, is determined to a large extent by the, um, uh, by the, uh, the by, by who the judge happens to be. And so we thought we should understand this better. This was what people assume, and we got evidence of that. And we also started to wonder why is it that in some cases there is no disagreement and there is unanimity. So we started to explore 
this and it's uh, this much more and we shifted away from uh, simply studying the law to understanding the 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 the, the processes of uh, judging and uh, then we realized that uh, one more thing and then i'll i'll i'll, I'll uh, stop uh, with this introductory part the one more thing we realized was uh, that the most important aspects of judging according to indian judges to which the maximum attention is given in judicial academies and judicial training is how to appreciate facts how to decide what facts are proved and are not proved how to appreciate law and then how to apply law to facts to decide whether someone is guilty or or uh, to be acquitted or whether there is civil liability or not now how do we reconcile this with the fact that in industrial countries and in many most democratic countries this appreciation of facts and deciding whether facts are proved or not proved this application of law to the facts to decide guilt or innocence or to decide liability is actually done by 12 ordinary jurors most of whom have had no legal education no prior experience in a court of law and no judicial training or or experience and this is such a sacred principle for them that they will never give it up it is the option of the of the defendant in a criminal case to decide whether he should have a bench as you know bench trial or jury trial so if the people are given the option or oh, we don't want 12 ordinary people to decide this case they they will not agree because for them this is very precious they prefer that to bench trials as as a general matter so why is it that the system as a whole and defendants prefer that uneducated legally uneducated legally illiterate judicially uneducated judicially illiterate people decide on what we consider to be the most important thing how to appreciate facts and how to appreciate law uh, uh, and apply it to to facts and decide guilt or innocence which i have learned heard judges say is a matter of learned judicial instinct acquired through experience it is believed to be a great skill but yet that skill is considered completely dispensable in industrial countries so are we putting the emphasis on judicial education and the challenge are we understanding the challenge of judging and the challenge of securing justice in perhaps not the right way we are putting emphasis on what is the easiest part of that process namely make deciding whether facts are proved or not and applying the the law to the law that is given to you to facts to decide guilt or or innocence that's easy to do that, that's a that's decision making uh, that is ju- judgment and decision making there's a field there called jdm we do that all the time all of us do that all the time that's why they can call in a bunch of of lay people and ask them to do it decision making is easy not difficult but if that is the case then what is the difficult part of securing justice and the difficult part i would submit has to do with the technology of judging in a democracy of understanding five very very crucial basic concepts on the basis of which a democratic judicial system operates and those five aspects are the constitution and the law justice democracy rule of law and reasoning this ordinary people don't understand they can understand but they're not trained to understand that what is the constitution what is justice what is the role of a court in a democracy so important that around barack wrote a book called judge in a democracy what is the rule of law and what is reasoning this is what i often refer to as the art science and craft of judging around these five fundamental concepts now this knowledge the lay person doesn't have and 
the job of the judge and the job of the lawyers in the courtroom is not to decide, make a decision on who is guilty and who is not, which any lay person can do. Not to decide what, what fact actually happened and what did not happen, which any lay person can do. But to make sure that this process is consistent with the Constitution, it secures justice, it protects democracy, and it is operated through the unique and special techniques and methodologies called rule of law and reasoning. And I found that these five concepts were and continue to be greatly neglected. They are the Cinderella's of judicial education and judicial training. They are not given adequate attention. Whereas these are the real areas of expertise for securing justice. So what we'll do today, uh, with your permission, is we will explore these conceptually. Uh, and then tomorrow, we will see how the, how the application of these concepts emerges in two case studies. I will discuss the instructions to the jury in the George Floyd case. Very recent case, very famous case in the United States, because from the instructions by the judge to the jury, we can see how deeply the court is safeguarding these five pillars, which is its role. And the judge tells the jury, now you decide the facts. You decide whether the, the person is guilty or not. That I don't need to do. You do that. I cannot do. You do that. But I am here to safeguard these five principles. Constitution, justice, democracy, rule of law, and reasoning. Right? And how we can extract that from the, the practical uh, working of a court in the United States in the form of a judge giving instructions to the jury in the recent George Floyd case. Second is I will discuss a very recent bail order issued by a Delhi Sessions Court. A very uh, interesting and, and uh, very interesting uh, bail order. And we will see how knowledge of knowledge of these five fundamental concepts helps the court to secure justice. And how without this knowledge, it is not possible to secure justice and uh, the the edifice of justice will come crashing down. So to, today we will uh, examine these concepts a little more. And again, I'm not here to give you definitions of these concepts. I'm no one to do that. I'm just a student of law. But hopefully this discussion will help our honorable judges to start taking these five concepts very seriously and studying them. There's enormous amount of material available on this, on the internet, in judgments, and to, to develop the art, craft, and science of judging in order to secure justice. So that's what we'll do today. And then tomorrow we will apply this uh, in, the, in, in two case studies, and then we'll have a discussion. But before I do that, I start doing that, I would like to request uh, um, Mr. Yarela Gada to kindly uh, get some feedback from the honorable judges on what they think are the practical challenges in securing justice from their point of view and their experience, so that we can have this discussion in the light of their own practical challenges. Thank you, sir. Uh, I am here to get the questions from the participants, uh, but I can give you one example, sir, just like uh, we had some discussion yesterday with some, not some, sir, near about uh, five to 600 Judicial officers had discussed this issue, sir. Yes. That is a priority is to procedure. What is the role? And what is the justice? Yes. Sir, the question uh, discussed was a, a, a vehicle was purchased on higher purchase agreement with finance from a banker. And the purchaser, without consent of the banker, sold it to third person. Yes. With, with an agreement, mutual agreement, that the third person will pay the installments. Since the installments were not paid, the banker issued notice to the registered owner. 
and registered owner took a smart move he launched a fir of cheating against the third person and police now seized that vehicle now all the three are asking the custody from the magistrate a uh, custody of the vehicle some are of the view that we cannot become mere recovery agents and therefore we should not give the vehicle to the banker the registered owner is the person who got the finance and purchased though he did not pay the installments it is a civil matter magistrate in the interim custody is should not be concerned about yes. and some said that the fundamental principle is that the vehicle should be restored to the third person from whom it was recovered so yes. here i think that procedure was much emphasized instead of the substantive law and this why this variation between the judges some think that a bank is the right owner to get the custody something that the buyer something that the third person yes sir please sir that's a thank you very much that's a very wonderful uh, uh, example and um, uh, i think i i in a, it, what it tells me sir is that the emphasis of the approach is on the decision on the decision we are jumping to as a matter of procedure we are jumping to what should be the decision we have seen the facts and we are then quickly jumping to the question should the bank have it or should the other person have it now i am submitting to you sir as we will see tomorrow when we go through the george floyd instruction to the jury the judge there is saying look this you decide i am not interested in this he doesn't say i am not interested in it it's not my responsibility so if you take that approach when we discussed yesterday when you discussed yesterday with the judges this question frankly they should be disinterested in the main question that they actually focused on namely who should get who should who should get custody of the vehicle because that is a decision that common people make can make but what a judge is specialized in what the art craft and science of judging uh, requires lawyers and in the room and judges the legal profession to do is really focus on how do you reach that decision not what the decision is it is like when we are taught mathematics sir the the, the uh, t, uh, or science the t, i i i have my bachelor's degree in science like hundreds of years ago but uh, um uh, but the um the emphasis is not on the right answer or the wrong answer sir it's the process by which you reach the answer that is important right? so we find that when we are acting really like jurors we are doing the easiest thing to do which is to decide it and then find some rationale for it whereas we are not emphasizing the the uh, the process by which we reach that discussion decision and the fundamental concepts on which that process of legal reasoning is made stands and that neglect is leading to inconsistency of approaches because that's the only way we can get consistency consistency cannot be in the decision in the out, outcome of the decision because that as i said is is not part of the art decision i would go as far as saying that in the classical model sir of of <clears throat> of uh, modern law the uh, except in a bench trial the decision on the final decision on proof facts and uh, liability or guilt is not part of the judicial decision making process at all the judicial decision making process lies in these other five areas that i talked about and that's where the debate should be and if we have a a science and a, and a craft on that then we'll find that automatically because i'll i'll get into that by the nature of that process we will all, there will be much more consistency in approach to decision making we are not looking for consistency of result we are looking for consistency of approach 
Now, if I go to a doctor and I say, I have a, my shoulder is paining, just fictitious, it is not, but uh, in hypothetical, but in my shoulder, and I go to a cardiologist, then the cardio, one card, cardiologist may tell me, you must have a surgery, someone else may say, don't have a surgery, but their methodologies will be the same. The, the authorized tests they will do, the way they will interpret the tests, and they will also give you reasons for their conclusion so that they can actually talk to each other and say, look, there are two rational options possible. You have a surgery, you don't have a surgery, and this is what you can do. Here are the risks and benefits of each of this. Now, I'm not saying what judges uh, decide or courts decide, lawyers and judges together um, are, are, are like medicine. Uh, it's not like that, but we should also have much greater consistency of approach to judicial decision making, and that is at the heart of securing justice. Justice is not simply a decision. Many judges in our country tell me very often, we have to go beyond the law to secure justice. And that tells me they're acting like jurors. They are not even jurors because even jurors are instructed by this process, but by lay people who think if these are the facts, this is justice and the law is coming in the way. And they are not actually working within the framework of, of, of securing justice, the methodologies of securing justice, which is what we need to, to focus on. The other practical difficulty, some of the, uh, in doing this, we will discuss tomorrow, which includes court management. Do we have time to, sorry? Sir, uh, I have two queries I can put up. Yes, 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 sir. Uh, one is, sir. Uh, sir, you have not just uh, spoke about uh, what are the important things that is the law, justice, uh, 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 democracy, rule of law, reasoning. So yes. these you have spoken, sir. So yes. the query is, if a case is clear on applying first four principles, as you have said, sir, yes. is it required to give reasoning in detail yes. by yes. writing too many paras or pages? Yes, that, yes, yes. That is one thing. And second thing, sir, sometimes it appears that while importing complete justice, we trial judges need to mold the law, need to mold the law, or sometimes yes. law is not much helpful. Uh, can I repeat, sir? Yes, yes. It appears that while imparting complete justice, yes, we trial judges need to mold the law. Yes. or sometimes the law is not much helpful. Yes. So what to do in such situations? Yes, yes. So the first questioning is, is reasoning, giving re is reasoning necessary? And the second question is, uh, basically what I was saying, that can you go beyond the law to do justice, to do complete justice? Can, can the law be molded to get complete justice? So these, see here again, my submission is these, both these questions come up, give too much emphasis to the jury function. Namely, what is the decision? How should I, what is, what should be the decision on this case? Liability or no liability, guilt or, or acquitted, guilty or acquitted. So the first, the, the, the first problem is we have to, we have, we, we have to ask ourselves, what is the responsibility of the judge? Is it just to, decide and dispose of the case? Or is it uh, something else? Is it to uphold the, the, the system of thinking and arriving at a conclusion and letting that system of thinking lead you to a conclusion? Rather than be indifferent to that system of thinking or be inadequately educated on that system of thinking, sophisticated about that system of thinking. Right. So th th that is where, sir, I think we should. Uh, sir, one, yes. one more short query, sir. Yes, yes, sir. This pertains to family court, may, may be extended to other courts also. Yes. In family mm -hmm. matters, the courts are supposed to deal with discretionary jurisdiction. Yes. This is because every case is unique. It becomes a tough job to use this discretion. Please guide us. Yes. So we'll, we'll come to that also. What does discretion mean? And uh, 
discretion does not mean that the the the, the subjective that the rule of law rules out an understanding of discretion that is a subjective decision making of a judge so what we can do sir is we can start uh, exploring these fundamental concepts and then come back to these questions uh, and see how they are applied so today will be a little conceptual because it is like understanding for example the 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 uh, the uh, uh, you know let me use an example i have used uh, in the presence of uh, mr sudhakar earlier to another audience and that is let's understand how a plane flies how a plane flies fine now uh, we can as passengers simply say i want to get to i want to get to delhi or colombo or or um, uh, you know um, or bombay um, or we can try to understand uh, not the destination of the plane but how the plane flies and if you are a pilot you cannot get to colombo or or uh, kathmandu or or bombay unless we you have you have a good understanding of how the plane flies and the plane as you know sir as you know well and we discussed uh, the other day uh, the the uh, uh, there are four forces that make makes a plane fly lift thrust drag and weight lift the air lifts the plane up thrust moves it forward and there are two counter forces that the plane uses in order to move where it wants to move drag resistance of the wind and the weight the gravity now it's unless you understand these four 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 uh, forces you cannot take the plane to its destination if one of these forces fail the plane will crash i would submit to you sir that these five forces are what keeps the system of justice in the air the constitution the idea of justice the uh, the idea of democracy the idea of rule of law and the idea of reasoning they are as important to to keeping the judicial system afloat as the ideas of lift thrust drag and weight which we passengers and even the pilot can neither see nor are aware of they are just looking at the schedule when is the coffee coming when is the uh, drink uh, when are the the snacks coming the uh, soft drinks coming and then uh, you are moving to your destination but actually what is taking you there are these four, four these four forces so similarly the five forces that keep the judicial system uh, afloat are these five forces and uh, if you don't have them they will crash and this is what i refer to as the physics of the of justice the physics of justice and uh, so we need to understand that so i think sir once we get into you'll find that discretion has no discretion as this question uh, implies has no place in this physics sir this is like saying can the does the pilot have discretion to ignore gravity and pretend he is in outer space pilot has discretion a lot of discretion lot of these sir when i have talked to pilots because of this interest of mine i have actually talked to pilots and they say that once in a blue moon completely unexpected events happen completely unexpected events happen and there's nothing but their personal judgment that decides whether the plane crashes or survives and they usually have a split second to make that decision one air india pilot told me he was flying back from the united states to india and he was having breakfast in the morning but suddenly he found that a fighter plane of maybe the united states or some other country was flying directly at him and he said i had a few seconds maybe less than a, a second i through the breakfast uh, tray off my uh, lap it went flying all over the uh, the cockpit and i immediately altered the 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 the, the altitude and course of the plane and that that uh, that uh, jet just zoomed inches past this commercial aircraft pilot error may be on the other side but this pilot saved lives that day sir but he has no discretion to ignore gravity 
he has no discretion to ignore weight. He cannot think he's dri driving a small glider plane. He's driving a 747. It has a certain number of passengers. It has a certain weight. He has to work within that. He cannot ignore thrust. He cannot ignore lift. Similarly, sir, a judge cannot out work outside the constitution, outside justice, outside democracy, outside rule of law, and outside reasoning. Within that, yes, there is a lot of judgment, not discretion, judgment that has to be made about how these forces have to be managed and to what end and to achieve what purpose. And the two main purposes or one main purpose is to ensure consistent justice across the country. Whether you are in in India, whether you are in Kerala, where I'm speaking from, I divide my time between Delhi and Kerala. I'm now in Kerala, which is the farthest away from Delhi of all the state capitals in Trivandrum. Whether you are in Trivandrum or in Srinagar or in uh, Ahmedabad or in Gauhati, the four corners of our country, four towns. When I walk into an Indian court, I must have a consistent approach to justice. And justice should not be whimsical and it should not be. And I'll come to why we found that in some cases there is consistency. There is consistency. It's not that in all cases it varies by judges. In many cases it does, but in many cases it doesn't. We need to understand why. And we need to ensure that we get consistency in securing justice. Substantively, OK, so this is so let me jump in, sir, because we have uh, uh, we, we are running out of time, but I would like to know if the honorable judges from Sri Lanka or Nepal have any put any questions they can pass on to you. I wish we had a platform where we could have just had a discussion, sir. It would have been wonderful. Sir, we have uh, questions are near about uh, 10 to 15, but again, the same thing pertaining to, as you said, sir, we will take up later on after your session is over. Yes, sir. yes, sir. We, we can take up them, sir, because we have tomorrow also. Yes, and yes. We can uh, 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 summarize these questions and put up yes. in a order. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you very yes. much. Please, sir, now, go ahead. Sir. Now, um, I would like to uh, also before I get into this, I want to know when do, do you want a break, sir, at some point and when? Uh, Sir, I think uh, now it is uh, 11 5. So at 12 o'clock, we will have a break. Sir. OK, sir. Uh, we will. OK, sir. As per, your, yes, sir as, as per your convenience. Sir, no, sir, we can, I think maybe uh, like 11 45 or so, so. So there is otherwise the first session may get a bit too yes. long. And, yes. And yes. we can come back at 12 and continue till 1 o'clock. Yes. So OK, now. I'd like to pick the first. So I made the first point I have made is that our objective of all the courts is to secure justice in a consistent manner. And I've made a second submission that uh, the challenge here is not to get the decision correct. Because we have done hundreds of simulations that show that there is no agreement within judges on what is the right decision, as Mr. Sudhakarji also has has pointed out today. There is no consistency on what should be the right decision. So that's not. So we have to shift our, our focus away from decision to the method of reaching that decision, which is what courts generally do and which I refer to as the art, science and craft. Please note sir, that I'm using the word art also because then there is a lot of room for creativity like the judge and you know and 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 deeper understanding. So we have to shift it away. That's my second point away from simply focusing on the decision and disposal of the case or settlement of the dispute. What is acceptable to the parties? I find that from Supreme Court downwards, a lot of judges feel that their job is to settle a dispute. And so they'll say, OK, what is like, although it was intended in a very different way, one of the Supreme Court judges controversially uh, and it was, I think, somewhat uh, yeah, taken out of context, but still it was, in my view, not the right question at all. Uh, where, uh, you know, in a rape case, the question was asked of the lawyer, will, will the rapist marry the, the victim? Very wrong question. But 
it is impelled by this anxiety to settle the dispute. And so the court as dispute settlement agency, court as decision maker, what is the job of a judge? He has a task. He's like a collector. He's like, like any bureaucrat. He's got a set of rules. He's got issues before him. He's got to, it's a task that has to be done as required and you get a salary for it. That's the second view of understanding judges. In both these things, there's an anxiety to reach a judgment, settle, dispose of the matter. But actually, if we understand the concepts of constitutional justice correctly, we will start to see a completely different role for courts and judges, which we will come to at the end of our <clears throat> discussion. So let me now start with how do we understand the constitution? Again, I'll be brief because I've uh, I, I want to finish one or two of these concepts before the break and then a couple of concepts after that. So how do we understand the constitution is a very important question. At one end, people understand the constitution as nothing but an, uh, a set of rules, supreme rules, the suprema lex, which overrides other statutes and allocates power, creates organs of the state to which power is allocated and regulates the exercise of that power. Now, this is not wrong. This is not wrong. But that is not what basically, certainly the Indian constitution is, and I would argue no constitution is like that. That is why in some, in some, as you know well, in, in some jurists refer to the, to, the, to the constitution using the concept of Brun norm, the basic norm. Norm means a value of conduct, which distinguishes right conduct and wrong conduct. So when you say constitution is a Brun norm, you're basically saying it is a basic value of conduct. And that is important because the only issue with which the legal system is concerned, the entire legal system is concerned, is whether human conduct is right or wrong. And if it's wrong, what the consequences are. Only a human being goes to a court and against only and can only go against another human being. Other fields of activity, like medical scientists are concerned about the virus. Virus is not a human being. They've got to study viruses and attack bad viruses. But lawyers in the legal field and judges, we are concerned only about human conduct and only about the rightness and wrongness of human conduct. And we do it in order to uphold the 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 mandatory rules of conduct which are imposed in relation to the most important values of human conduct, not the least important values of human conduct. And therefore, if those fundamental rules of human conduct are not maintained by the legal system, society falls apart, as many of us fear is going on in different parts of the world from time to time. And so the Courts and judges have a very special responsibility to uphold the right rules of conduct. That's why the constitution is referred to as a Brun norm, a norm meaning a value of conduct. Now, we recently had a very interesting judgment, which uh, Mr. Uh, Sudhakarji can share uh, if he wishes with the participants by Justice uh, Ravindra Bhatt in the uh, Supreme Court of India, uh, February 2020 where Justice Ravindra Bhatt, the Supreme Court of India, actually formulates a very new and very different understanding of what the Constitution is. And Justice Bhatt says that the Constitution is a, an agreement, a compact, he uses the word C-O-M-P-A-C-T, compact, an agreement between people on how they will treat each other. I think that's a very remarkable and very insightful definition of a constitution. So a constitution as an agreement between the people, not something imposed on the people, we the people of India. 
in, says, begins the constitution, like in the United States constitution, we the people are agreeing, not imposing, agreeing with each other on how we should treat each other. And in that judgment, Justice Butt gives a lot of importance to a very neglected part of the basic framework of the Constitution, the basic structure of the Constitution, that is fraternity, the idea of fraternity, friendliness, friendship. And he says, look, basically what the people of this country agreed is that we will treat each other in a friendly way, fraternal way. For that, we must respect each other's freedom. We must respect each other's equality. We must respect each other's dignity. Someone who does not respect my dignity, someone who takes away my freedom and, and does not and treats me as an inferior is not my friend. That's not friendly behavior. So Justice Butt says that basically, I'm not using his words, I would say that he sees the Constitution of India as an instrument of establishing friendly relationships between people. And gives us a guide for that. Now that guide is a very interesting guide because there's a lot of conflict in society, especially in our country, huge conflict. We have 1,300 million people. Very diverse in every possible way. Lot of scarce resources, lot of poverty, massive poverty, massive lack of, uh, of basic resources for the people of this country. Dehumanizing poverty. So naturally, there's a lot of conflict. Now, how do you resolve this conflict? How do you create friendly relationships in such a context? This is a very practical question for administrators and for judges. And here, I, I find Justice Butt's uh, um, judgment very helpful because he's refocusing our attention. This is not simply an administrative document. That's why we don't consider a constitutional law a, part, a branch of administrative law. Constitutional law comes from the word constitution. And Justice Butt is telling us a constitution is a compact, an agreement between the people on how to establish a friendly, caring society, a set of friendly relationships with each other. Now, that is also interesting very briefly because if you take the Indian Constitution, the Indian Constitution says, right, we the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a republic. Now, constitute means to put something together which doesn't exist. They did not say, we the people of India having solemnly resolved to continue India as a feudal society or to revert India into its past. They use the word, we have resolved to constitute India into a republic, which it is not. If it is not, if it is already a republic, you don't need to constitute it. It already exists. You only constitute what does not exist. So we, the people of India, whatever our past was of an India that was feudal, that was always ruled, except in Buddhist times, according to Dr. Ambedkar, when we had democratic social order, according to Dr. Ambedkar. We, we, we were always ruled by monarchs, whether British monarch or Mughal monarch or the monarchs who of our own uh, soil and our own production, whether they were from our soil or not, but uh, uh, monarchs who emerged here. 
So they didn't say we are going to continue monarchy and feudalism. They said we have decided to constitute a India into a republic. The word into is very important also. Which is democratic. And we'll come to this meaning of the word democratic earlier, uh, later. But Justice Button, the Supreme Court says at the heart of this compact of the people of India is to create a fraternal society with fraternity and friendship between each other. So we see the constitution as an instrument to establish friendly relationships between people, which, are, which can be done in two ways. One is by upholding principles of conduct that are conducive to friendly relationships, and second by deterring and opposing values of conduct which are inimical to friendly to friendly relations. So coming back to the question, how do you deal with conflict when there is such a lot of conflict in our country? And there, I think a lot of experts in conflict resolution say that the way to resolve a conflict is to find a common ground between people, a common ground between people, which they cannot reject, which they cannot reject. And what the Constitution get, tells us is that gives us, not tells us, gives us is a set of common principles of conduct that no one can reject in this country. High level constitutional principles. So I can disagree with my neighbor over whether I can take extra water from the well or not. I can I can I can tell my uh, my neighbor can tell me you are an uh, and uh, from an untouchable community, you cannot touch the well uh, water in my well. And I can say, well, that's correct. And so, you know, uh, uh, but I, I, I don't agree with that. Your, that's your view. That's not, I'm, uh, you know, your view. That's that may be your view, but I don't accept it. It's a common well. It's public resources. And I want to use that water now. At the level of can a untouchable use water, uh, you know, used also by the upper caste is an issue on which the upper caste and the untouchables disagree. And they, we've had violent conflict over this. People have died over this particular issue. But when you elevate this issue up to the principle of fraternity, which is in the constitution, and you ask the upper caste and the, the untouchable the question, can we survive unless we we live together and work together? Then they will say. You're right, we we must have any rational person would say we have to live in friendship. And then you say, can we live in friendship? Unless we respect each other. You respect my concerns, I respect your concerns. And then we say that's what we mean by equality. Because you respect each other, not because I'm rich and educated and powerful. You respect only because I have something in me, which is the essence of I'm a human being. I have the essence of humanity in me. You have humanity. I have humanity. This was not created by us. This was not given to us. It was not earned by us. We did not work for it. We were born with it. And be, because we value our own species, we must learn to respect each other's humanity equally. You don't have any a few inches, a few ounces more of humanity than me. We all have the same humanity. And if we have to live together with fraternity, we must have mutual respect. And if we must have mutual respect, we must have equality. And equality, frankly, gives nothing. It means nothing more than giving equal and highest value to the humanity of all human beings. And giving all other features of human beings like power, wealth, knowledge, skills, much less value, only contextual value. But there's only one overriding value for us, and that is. The human essential humanity of people, that's what equality means that we, we treat each other, first of all, as equal human beings, and then suddenly we realize that unless we respect each other, we treat each other as human beings, then and we oppose ideas that deny that humanity, um, we will not be able to coexist. We also say that without liberty, 
without freedom you want freedom i want freedom and unless we respect each other's freedom we cannot live in friendship because the moment you start taking away my freedom there will be conflict so we have the constitution has given us and similarly dignity look you are telling me i can't drink water because i am an untouchable you are attacking my dignity my self worth my self respect and 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 if that is the case then we cannot live together as friends so the constitution as an instrument of creating a friendly society has established four core values that are necessary to have a friendly society the commitment to friend friendliness fraternity first the commitment to equality because friends respect each other simply because they are human beings and a commitment to liberty because friends are not people who take away each other's freedoms and a commitment to dignity and a philosophical framework of society which we call democracy democracy comes from two words we'll come back to this later but uh, it comes from the word kratos which k r a t o s which means power and demos which means common people so the principle that brings us together is that power shall be held by us not by some ruler so these five core cardinal principles together together provide a framework for us to live in peace with each other because i don't want to see you slaughter my children now i don't want to see my children slaughter you, you slaughter slaughter your children so let us live together in peace so when we elevate issues to these five accepted principles we have a basis to create a friendly relationship in society we have a consistent task across the country to convince people about the invaluable the precious importance of these five values to keep us together that's what the constitution gives us so we understand the constitution as an instrument to establish a friendly society as a basis for friendly relationships between people and then the constitution asks it said how do we do this when there's so much conflict in this country so they say okay we can do this by lifting elevating this is like to go back to the physics of the of justice lift lift like a plane lifts lift it to the to these five values of human conduct how we treat each other we treat each other with on uh, with uh, uh, on the basis of equality on the basis of fraternity on the basis of dignity on the basis of liberty and committed to equal sharing of power which is the basis of democracy so no one can disagree no one can disagree no rational person can disagree that these five principles are necessary for people to live together in peace wherever you are in the world this is not western eastern indian sri lankan nepalese this is human this is the lesson that we have learnt as humanity through thousands of years distilled and given to us in a language that may now uh, we are speaking in english so we have to use these uh, you, we have to use these uh, these these values uh, these words but there is one other word i will add to it which is uh, in the con- in a, comes from our freedom struggle and informs all these five values very important to us in india and i believe in sri lanka and i believe in nepal and i believe in pakistan and i believe in bangladesh i believe in in all these countries in the indian subcontinent this fifth value is most important which is not adequately emphasized in in the jurisprudence of other countries and that is the value of compassion anukampa karuna when muslims pray five times a day they are praying to god the beneficent and the merciful the christians consider god an embodiment of compassion the buddhists the jains the hindus 
We all believe in Anukampa and Karuna. Very, very important for us. So for us to have a friendly society, we need these five values, which are universal in nature. Anukampa is also universal in nature, but it is probably because of the long traditions of these, all these religious traditions, five religious traditions in, in our subcontinent, all of which agree on the importance of Anukampa and compassion. Very important to the people of this country. That's where the principle of nonviolence comes from in, in, in the Indian experience, from the principle of Anukampa. When Anukampa informs uh, also these five values, then we have a, a fantastic framework for building a friendly society. So ultimately, a judge is sitting in the court in order to promote values which will establish a, 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 a fraternity in our country, in the, in the words of the Supreme Court, or in layperson's terms, which will establish a friendly society, a society where people care for each other, and a, pe and, and a society in which uh, the, the, the relationships are friendly. And that is the meaning of the word fraternity. So we understand, the first point is we understand the constitution in this manner as an instrument to promote and establish a friendly society. Now I come to the word justice related to this, very important word. Justice, as many of you know, who have heard me before, I've been repeating <laughs> ad infinitum, that the word justice comes from the word J-U-S. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, can you include the social justice also? Sir, that will, I, I will bring it within the concept of justice, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank with, you, sir. Thank you for the timely reminder, sir. Sir. I find that Sudhakarji is a very highly uh, uh, wonderful cha chair or anchor of, of these discussions. Sir. Very timely. Thank you, sir. So the, um, uh, so the word justice uh, comes from the originate from the word use. I'm sorry I'm talking so much. Normally I like to be interactive, but this platform doesn't give us that option um, uh, of directly speaking to each other and interrupting each other. Uh, so Dhakarji is of course wonderful to stop me whenever necessary. So justice comes from the word J-U-S, J-U-S, which is pronounced, as you know, as use, use, as if it is Y-U-S. To all of us in the legal profession, this is probably the, the single most important word, technical word, which a lot of jurors may not understand, although they're called, J the juror also comes from JUS, but they don't understand the meaning. The first thing any judge needs to know is to really deeply understand and reflect on the word use. It is a root of the word judge, J-U-S plus D-E-C-I-R-E, decire is the root of the word judge. So what does use mean? What does use mean? Use basically means the right value of conduct, the right norm, not of conduct, the right norm. We'll get to conduct in a minute. The word use means the right norm, the right value. So I can tell a judge your de decision is just. It means that your decision meets the right norms. I can also tell someone in a coffee shop, I want just half a cup of coffee, just half a cup of coffee. I'm using the same word just. Why am I using that? Because half a cup is the right norm. People don't realize that when they use this word. But whenever you use the word use, you're denoting that there is a right norm. You're reminding people when you say, this is not just. You're saying this does not meet the right norm. When you say this is just, you say this meets the right norm. And therefore, what we are meaning, what we are doing when, when we discuss justices, we are actually focusing on the question, uh, what is the right norm? Now, in the context of law, the word use means right value of human conduct, because as I said earlier, the legal system is only concerned with human conduct. And therefore, when we talk of use in the legal context, we mean only right value of human conduct. 
not right value of right norm of how much t i want only right value of human conduct that's our only our only concern as a as a discipline now what does justice mean justice is a combination of the word jus j u s plus the word s t i c e s t i c e actually means still not, not moving unmoving not moving still so we refer to sol stis sol meaning sun sun as in sun and moon and stis meaning standing still so we find that in summer solstice and winter solstice the sun moves comes to a halt and then moves back when it stands still we say that solstice so stis means yus is sta is standing still now amartya sen has discussed this once or twice in his book and in one or two other articles where he has discussed it also with quain one of the leading philosophers of the united states and they in my humble view went on a wrong track and said does justice mean the law has come to a standstill and it can you know and they could did not take it further because i think they did not really remember or apply their mind to the real meaning of the word use which is not law but a standard of human conduct a value of human conduct and therefore if you combine use with stis as a standing still you say that justice means those values of human conduct that stand still that never change that never change so justice means eternal values of human conduct eternal values of right human conduct so we we say justice prevails or justice has been done when actual human conduct in a fact pattern is consistent with these eternal values values that never change that stand still so we say when these values crystallize into actual human conduct then we say there is justice why because actual human conduct is in line with eternal values we say justice shall be secured means we shall ensure that the conduct the right thing is done we say there is injustice meaning that human conduct is not following the right values the eternal values so the second point the first point i made was to say the constitution should be understood according to the 2020 february judgment of the supreme court as a framework for establishing fraternity or friendly relations amongst people established by the people themselves that framework those norms those the agreement on those norms have been entered into by the people with each other so now we know that the constitution has established uh, is a, is a, has established a republic based on an agreement between people on maintaining friendly relationships we now know also that justice refers to the right values of conduct not today's value or tomorrow's values but what is right forever what does not change unchanging right values of conduct therefore justice becomes necessary to ensure that relationships are maintained on a friendly basis an unfriendly behavior is 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 uh, treated as injustice so justice is a codification in of the of what we believe is the right conduct necessary to maintain fraternity and friendly relationships between people because justice simply refers to the right values of human conduct and therefore in my argument in my work i say justice if you ask not the content of justice but what is it then i say it is a standard of human conduct it is a standard of human conduct but what is its content its conduct content is right conduct the definition of right conduct the values that constitute right conduct 
that is justice so just if justice is the values of is 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 a, is a set of values a standard of right human conduct we have very different approaches to what is right human conduct uh, right conduct by human beings in india so how do we resolve these differences i told you before that the te technique of resolving differences is to elevate to lift it to the highest level that is acceptable to everyone and that's what i said i argued that the constitution does it has distilled four very clear values and i read into it a fifth value and those four clear values are fraternity the value they value that relationships and human conduct must be friendly another word for it is social because socius also means friend s o c i u s means friend social means friendly anti social means unfriendly so the first agreement amongst the people of india in the words of the supreme court in february 2020 the first element of that compact is that we shall maintain fraternity we shall maintain friendship with each other and the second element of that is that we shall respect each other so you have equality and dignity we shall give equal value to our humanity ignore all other factors and respect each other's dignity so we have fraternity equality and dignity we shall respect each other's freedom because we all want to be free and that is liberty except if you take away my freedom i'll restrain your right to take away my freedom nothing beyond that and finally we accept that we shall share power equally amongst us that we the demos shall exercise kratos and that is democracy i also argued that there is a fifth implicit element that comes out of our freedom struggle and of our long and ancient history across the entire subcontinent and that is that we shall be compassionate to each other compassion means anukampa means kampna in sanskrit and hindi means tremble tremble anukampa kampa means that when you have pain i tremble because i feel that pain it is not sympathy it is not you feel pathos i feel pathos we both feel pathos that is sympathy this is empathy you have pathos and your pathos is inside me your pathos not my pathos is inside me anukampa that i feel your pain so these five values together are the values the core values of right conduct the groom norm which we call justice constitutional justice constitutional justice and when we say in article 39a that the operation of the legal system shall promote justice we mean that the legal system of the country shall promote safeguard secure fraternity equality dignity liberty democracy and i would add compassion anukampa so then when i said as we will see when we turn to the practical applications of these principles in actual case law in a recent delhi sessions court judgment and in the, the instructions to jury in george floyd and you can see the difference be of the fifth factor the compassion that is there in the indian judge which you may not find i'm sure compassion is there everywhere but compassion is part of our much more visible part of our conscious thinking than it is in, in I, i have found in many other countries i've lived in the in the united states for many years i've taught law there i've worked there and they are very compassionate people they're very compassionate people but our formal frameworks uh, can and should recognize uh, the idea of compassion uh, more than they do but we will see tomorrow in the practical application of these ideas to practical cases in the george floyd case the reaction of the public to george floyd was pure compassion pure compassion people felt the pain of george floyd the the there was a young girl who videotaped whose videotape became the most crucial part of the of the evidence against the police officer who killed george floyd a young girl 
And she was crying on the witness stand, saying every night I'm apologizing to him that I could do nothing to save your life. Yes, I taped the way you were killed, but I could not stop it. She feels his pain in herself. That is compassion. So all human beings have enormous compassion. Our challenge is how can we bring this compassion into our framework of decision making uh, in courts and should we? So that's a separate area. So what I'm arguing is constitution should be understood in the words of the Indian Supreme Court, new words of the Supreme Court in February 2020, but not a new idea as an agreement amongst we the people of India to establish fraternity, friendly relationships in our country amongst people. And as I said, in a country full of conflict that can only be done by invoking the power of the highest values that no one, no matter what your caste, creed, religion, gender, wealth, assets, power, no one can deny the validity of, of, the, of these values. And those values are these five values that the Constitution of India provides to us as a basis of a society based on fraternity. And the job of the Indian legal system and of every judge in every decision they make is to make sure that they inform the people of the country, the parties before them, and the society in which they live and work, the larger society, that by taking this decision, I am sending a signal that fraternal values are accepted and valued in our society and inimical values are not approved in our society. So if you punish someone whose the values that you are judging are actually fraternal values, you're going to weaken the constitution and you're going to weaken the republic. If you let someone go who has clearly been antisocial and anti-fraternal and inimical in, in, the, in the values that he practiced, and if you allow and respect those inimical values of hatred, of anger, of violence, then again we will be damaged, we'll, we will be fatally mortally wounding the republic. So every decision we make, the outcome must be guided by this vision. So when we go back to the example that uh, uh, Mr. Yaralagada gave us, the question to be asked is not who should have the car. The question to be asked is, what is what is the value that should guide this question? Now, everyone knows that the financial system and the economic system operates, economists will tell you, operates on the basis of trust and expectation. So fraternity, the value of fraternity requires people to be able to trust each other and rely on the legal agreements they make. And therefore, we bring into that ideas of, certainly bring into, into that question, the ideas of the relevance of fraternity as a value. And the economic system being very, very much a central part of, of having a, a, a fraternal relations, the importance of the value of trust. There are two issues of trust here. The bank trusted the nominal borrower. The nominal borrower trusted the third party to which the, the obligation to repay the mortgage was assigned. Two levels of trust going on here. Where was the betrayal of trust here? How can we create, create an outcome that will ensure that the, 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 uh, that people, that banks will, will trust clients and, and people will trust each other? Was there some cheating here? That's why we criminalize fraud. Because we want to create a society that is friendly and don't <laughs> people don't cheat each other. So we suddenly get a different framework of analysis of this of this case. Other and then you'll find that the judges agree more and disagree less. 
Whereas earlier, many judges said bank should have it, this guy should have it. Now we ask a different question. We understand that this case involves actually a, a, a question of mutual relationships based on agreement, based on respecting the contract, respecting the um, and trusting the the uh, the, um, uh, the the legal documents that were entered into. There was a good faith agreement and uh, reliance on that agreement. That value has to be protected. What is the decision that will? I don't know enough of the facts, and frankly, that's a jury decision. I'm not interested in it. I'm interested only in in the in the in the criteria that will. Uh, we will rely on to make that decision. I think the criteria, even in that case, I can apply this framework already and say, look, this is how you will resolve that framework. You will consider how this will uh, will will enhance or uh, or uh, damage uh, between these people and the community and the nation at large uh, fraternity and fraternal relations with each other. So, uh, so these are the two points that I've made so far understanding the constitution as a project of establishing fraternity and friendly relations between the people of a very diverse, very different and highly conflicted, highly unequal, very rich and very poor, very complex society. The only way we can stay together as India is through fraternity. And for that fraternity to establish that fraternity, we have I, we, we know that conflict can be resolved only by elevating the conflicts and, and telling people that your conflict is going to be resolved with reference to highest level of five values, which are eternal values. And that you cannot and you no reasonable person can reject. Let's apply those values and see how this conflict can be resolved. And then you'll be able to find solutions. And that those set of eternal values is what we mean by justice, because justice is a benchmark is the North Star about what is the right conduct, eternal right conduct that all human beings should follow. And therefore, when the Constitution of India says we have established, we have constituting India into a republic to secure to ourselves justice, social, economic and political, what the Constitution means is that we are establishing a society in which social, economic and political relationships shall be guided by justice, which means eternal values laid down in the Constitution by the right values laid down in the constitution, the highest values laid down in the constitution. So justice means the values that are laid for us in the legal field, the values of human conduct that are laid down in the constitution. So we've done those two things. We can come back and then we will tackle the, uh, the methodology, uh, the conceptual methodology of, uh, of, of, of doing this in terms of the, uh, the other values that we 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 talked about, which is uh, uh, um, rule of law and reasoning. That's very important. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, shall we take a break? Ah, uh, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, before taking the break, I would like to put up a related question. Uh, yes, sir. Since, uh, sir, you have uh, dealt with the concept of justice, and I want to go into the concept of law also now. Rule of law. Uh, rule, rule of law. law. Yes, sir. Yes. And. and uh, Sir, uh, maybe a related query, sir. Uh, one honorable uh, justice from Sri Lanka put yes, it like sir. this: put it uh, like this. Justice and law all always always are not same. Justice and law always are not same. Yes. Yes. People That's mostly true. people mostly look for justice, but not for law. Yes. But yes. they want justice based on law. Yes. So how to balance this? That is exactly what the con the fundamental force, which we call rule of law, that keeps our judicial system in the air. That's exactly what the concept of rule of law and reasoning do, sir. So we'll come back. That's a thank you, sir, uh, Justice from Sri Lanka, for this wonderful question that gives us a perfect. A transition to the session ne next part of the last part of the session for today when we come back.